Okay, got it. Okay, got it. Okay, got it. <laughs> Shiny is one of the most powerful boy groups K-pop has ever seen. Nicknamed the Princes of K-pop, Shiny has played an integral role in K-pop's growth, sparking fashion trends, cultivating the defining musical sounds of a generation, and breaking boundaries across the globe. Shiny's incredible impact in K-pop is still felt today. But how? Is Shiny really that popular? What happened to them and why does their success even matter? If you're a Shewal, K-pop fan, aspiring artist, or maybe you're so curious about them, stick around as we dive into the career of Shiny and its members in honor of their 15th anniversary to find out how Shiny has left an unforgettable mark on the music industry. What's up friends? I'm Jonathan Miller and welcome back to Jonathan Miller Music where we help each other become better artists. Shiny has gone from barely promoted rookie group to a force to be reckoned with not only with in K-pop but within the entire global music industry. The CEO of Abbey Road Studios once compared Shiny to the Beatles when they became the first K-pop group to play a solo concert in London. President Barack Obama said young Americans had taken more of an interest in Korean culture and language because of groups like Shiny at the 2017 Asia Leadership Conference. Responsible for several viral memes and creating staple K-pop hits with songs like Ring Ding Dong, Lucifer and Sherlock, Shiny has played a major foundational role in the spread of the Hallyu wave and that role can still be felt in today's K-pop world. But before we get into the video, I want to explain a few things because I would rather do this video right and have it get seen by five people than be careless doing it wrong and having it seen by hundreds of thousands of people. First and foremost, this is an essay style video, meaning we will be talking about Jonghyun, his life, his career, his death, mental health, and other sensitive subjects because they're relevant to the points I'll be making later on in the video. If those subjects are triggering to you or you don't want to watch another video discussing Jonghyun's death, then this is not the video for you and you are free to click away. That's perfectly okay. I absolutely respect that. You don't have to watch this video. It's okay. We'll see you in the next one. I bring these topics up later in the video, not for shock value, but because I believe in dismantling the stigma around mental health issues in the arts as somebody who has been on that edge before. If you've seen my video on remembering Jonghyun or you've been with me since before 2017, you will already know that Jonghyun is one of my biggest musical influences. And his loss had a profound effect on me both personally and professionally. So that being said, this video is not going to be all sad. This is a celebration video. And while the loss of Jonghyun is sad and sometimes really hard to talk about, there have been many positives that have come from it in his honor too. Shiny will always be five, but more on that later. Secondly, this video is sponsored, but I have made a donation directly to the Shiny Foundation and have included a link in the description if you would like to do the same. If you don't know who or what the Shiny Foundation is, that's okay. More on them in a little bit. Now, if you're still with me after that long but important tangent, this is why Shiny deserves their flowers. And if you don't really know who Shiny is, this is why you should care. The world in the mid-2000s is a far cry from the world of today. In 2008, an estimated 1.5 billion people frequently used the internet around the world, as opposed to today where that number has skyrocketed up to 5.18 billion active users. That same year in 2008, major events were taking place that would actively shape the remainder of the decade. President Barack Obama became the first black president of the United States. The global financial crisis hit its peak, resulting in several countries falling into recessions. The Apple App App Store opened for the first time on the first iterations of the iPhone and iPod Touch. It's going to reach every single iPhone user. Twilight owned the souls of millions of teenagers around the globe to help them cope with the loss of the high school musical movie franchise coming to an end. MySpace also reached its finale before it became an ancient relic of the internet. YouTube only had an active 160 million users on its platform in comparison to today where there are 2.68 billion people using the website, a 105% growth rate increase. And your boy was the sophomore in high school experiencing it all in real time. Okay, maybe that last part isn't important, but you get the picture. YouTube was a different beast in the 2000s. Video replies were a thing, music video parodies, or parodies in general, dominated the platform, most of which have not aged gracefully. Music videos in general were starting to make their way onto the platform as social media began to influence pop culture much more directly. However, this created a problem for the music industry, which had traditionally only run music videos on television, and it was already hard at work trying to fight things like illegal downloads 
sounds of music, courtesy of things like LimeWire. The music industry was going head to head with the digital generation and it was kind of slow figuring out how to deal with it. A few ways the industry fought illegal downloads, remember streaming, even the term itself wasn't much of a thing back then, was manipulation of the music itself. The ultimate goal of record companies is obviously to get people to buy records. Go buy the album. Well, with the rise in illegal downloads and a worldwide recession, album sales in general were declining. So in order to protect the official album versions of songs, labels and producers got a little bit inventive. This manifested itself in ways like the mid-2000s producer tag at the beginning of a hit single or sponsored products in music videos. It showed up in random breaks during the music video to prevent people from downloading the video, removing the song, and uploading it illegally as an MP3, which of course they did anyway. I mean, we were full on coding HTML on MySpace like it was nothing. It also manifested itself in having the music video version of a song be a remix, different from the official album version. Sometimes they went as far as slightly pitch shifting the song on the music video when uploaded to YouTube. Vivo became a thing in 2009, which was a place on YouTube where artists who were signed to labels could upload their official music videos where the thumbnail had the Vivo tag, so you knew it was the official version. Billboard, for example, didn't factor in YouTube videos for chart consideration until 2013. So strictly speaking, official music videos back then on YouTube were almost purely for promotion. And you can promote your music videos with DistroKid. DistroKid is a fantastic music distribution platform built by artists and music lovers for artists. They help artists like you and me get our music up on streaming platforms like Spotify, Apple Music, Tidal, and even here on YouTube. For one small yearly price, you can distribute as much music as you'd like and even get access to a whole bunch of other helpful tools and services too. One such separate service is DistroVid. DistroVid is music video distribution made easy and affordable. Ever wonder how artists get their videos up for sale on iTunes or on Apple Music? Well, this is kind of how. Start by picking the places you want your music video to go, mark if it's previously released or it's going to be released in the future, add your record label if you've got one, and your languages that the song is in, pick the genres that best describe your song and add the song title. You can let DistroVid know if there's a featured artist you need to credit and whether or not this is a concert or live footage video. Choose your video file and add a short description. Add all the songwriting credits or any other credits that you need to. Mark if it has explicit lyrics or if it's a radio edit. Connect your artist profiles, click the important checkboxes, and soon your music video will be on its way to stores. Use my special VIP link to save yourself 7% on your first first year's membership with DistroKid. Link is in the description. Back in 2008, a million views on a YouTube video meant that a good portion of total YouTube users had actually seen that video and were probably talking about it the next day at school. A million views on a YouTube video today can happen for literally millions of other videos and you might never have seen them. So viral dance trends during a time when everyone and their sibling wanted to be in a dance crew. Here were truly viral. People uploaded their dance covers, dance rehearsals, or dance crew videos from talent shows or the like because people online loved watching them, no matter where you were in the world. So it came as no surprise when five young men from South Korea decided to upload their own dance practice video, unknowingly at the time striking a match that would soon set fire to a new industry standard. SM Entertainment is one of what's known as the big three entertainment companies in South Korea. The CEO and founder of the company, Lee Soo Man, has been referred to by many media outlets as one of the pioneers of K-pop and the godfather of K-pop for his role in the Hallyu wave. Debuting as a singer himself in 1971, <laughs> Isuman earned his master's degree at California State University, Northridge, during the 80s. It was during this time in the United States where he witnessed the rise of MTV and music icons like Michael Jackson, Madonna, Whitney Houston, and more firsthand. Returning to Korea in 1985, Isuman continued working as a DJ until 1989 when he finally had enough money to establish SM Studio. Isuman's vision of what K-pop could grow to be was directly influenced by his experiences in the USA. His goal 
goal was to not only develop the Korean pop music industry, but also make it so strong it could become a global phenomenon, akin to the way European and North American acts dominated the global music industry. While certainly not a perfect person, being involved in embezzling controversies and famously locking boy group TVXQ members into 13-year-long contracts, Isuman had a vision for K-pop and I will at least give him credit for sticking to it. South Asian boys, whose member Young Hyun Suk would eventually go on to form another big three entertainment company, YG Entertainment, is largely and historically credited with pioneering the inclusion of rap in K-pop hits. This is largely why YG idols and groups today tend to be especially gifted in rap and hip-hop as it's a staple of the company's foundation. South Asian boys were widely popular and broke up during their heyday in 1996. This left a void in the Korean music scene that Isuman was eager to fill. Similar to the entertainment system in Japan, where idols are trained before debuting in various groups or teams, Isuman is credited as one of the pioneers of K-pop because of his system for creating K-pop idols for teenagers, a system that is now the entire industry's standard. SM Studio, rebranded in 1995 as SM Entertainment, developed an in-house production team and eventually debuted HOT to the world, Korea's first official idol group. HOT was a big success, proving that SM's training system was working. Their hit single, famous for its infectious bubblegum melody and bright colors, Candy, eventually led HOT to win Best New Artist at the 11th Golden Disc Awards. Their first four albums all sold over a million copies. In 1998, the Chinese music market was dominated by slow lyrical songs because only state-owned record companies could release albums into China. However, given HOT's growing popularity and after after some convincing, the Shanghai Audiovisual Publishing House agreed to license and distribute HOT's Mandarin language album. Only predicted to sell about 5,000 copies, the album sold over 50,000, which made HOT not only the first Korean artist to debut in China, but also the first Korean artist to do so successfully. This one move had massive economic benefits as the 1997 Asian financial crisis ravaged South Korea, as I explained at length in my deep dive on BOA. The sales brought money into South Korea and China, helping to support both economies. In short, not only was training idols in musical skills this way worth it, but also so was training them in foreign languages. SM boy groups have broken barriers and made history following the success of HOT. Xinhua is currently the longest running Korean boy group ever, having released 13 Korean studio albums in their 20 plus year career. TVXQ, who definitely deserves a deep dive like this one day, was the first Korean group to perform and sell out the Tokyo Dome in Japan. Super Junior's Sorry Sorry is now a K-pop staple, becoming a national and international number one hit for several consecutive weeks. Fly to the Sky, although not as successful as their label mate official idol groups, did find chart success as an R&B duo when their album Sea of Love sold nearly 250,000 copies in 2002. While Isuman's system of churning out idols like a factory seemed like a guaranteed win, even as girl groups continued to make waves too, everything in music is an experiment. Can we replicate so-and-so's success? Can we top our previous sales record? Will the public receive well this concept or this sound? Nothing is ever for sure, especially in an industry that now found itself battling the internet during the rise of social media. With so much uncertainty, it was time to pull back the reins and let the public really decide if a group had staying power and see if this quick churn out of groups was worth the financial investment. What did SM learn from this? Never underestimate the power of young people. Popular music in the 2000s is often fused with one of three other genres depending on the time period. The first two years of the decade still clung to the bubblegum sound of the new millennium. Midway through the decade, R&B and club-oriented sounds dominated radio before transitioning into electropop and dance pop as the 2000s became the 2010s. Shiny was introduced to the world as a contemporary R&B boy group with skills in all areas of the arts. SM's previous boy groups were doing well and the expectations for Shiny were high from the company. Debuting on May 25th, 2008, Onyu, Ki, Mino, 
Taemin and Jong Hyun released Replay, which sold nearly 18,000 copies and peaked at number 8 on various Korean music charts. As opposed to Super Junior's debut, which consisted of two promo singles, a free download that crashed the SM Super Junior website server due to its quick popularity and promotions, Chinese Replay initially did not see much promotion from the label, but regardless, the song and Shiny became a fire amongst the public. Winning Rookie of the Month literally a month later in June at the Psy World Digital Music Awards, Shiny dropped their first full-length album, The Shiny World, and its title track, Love Like Oxygen, which sold over 30,000 copies in August, and nabbed them their first music show win on Korean music shows. Shiny's vibrancy, high-top sneakers, and colorful skinny jeans sparked an immediate fashion trend in South Korea, appropriately dubbed the Shiny trend by the media. Colorful skinny jeans became a popular fashion trend among millennials around the globe, as evidenced in other music videos, yearbooks, and the comment sections on TikTok where some of y'all make fun of millennials wearing skinny jeans as you sit there wearing fashion inspired by the 70s and early 2000s and think we don't notice. Don't look at me like that. I'm a Virgo. I'm petty. I literally wrote a whole song about it. Anyway. <laughs> Shiny won the Best Style Icon Award at the Style Icon Awards toward the end of 2008. They won Best New Male Group, Newcomer Album of the Year, and were actually getting so popular they swept all of Korea's Rookie Awards in 2008, becoming the first K-pop group to achieve what's now known as a Rookie Grand Slam. In 2009, Shiny dropped Juliet, a remake of Corbin Blue's Deal With It, which led them to winning first place on KBS's Music Bank. I've explained the process several times in many other videos, but in case you're not familiar, back in the 2000s, K-pop was nowhere near as well known as it is now. So music industries in other countries oftentimes bought what are known as recording rights from songwriters to produce these sort of remakes of popular songs in other territories. It's a process known as getting songs placed and is a very legal and very normal way for songwriters to earn money. So Deal With It, written by English singer Jay Sean, who originally intended to have the song on his album, ultimately decided that the song did didn't fit with what he was doing, so the song was placed with Corbin Blue. Then, SM Entertainment bought the recording rights to the song, and then gave the song to Shiny to record, one of the caveats being that it be rewritten for Korean audiences, which members Jong Hyun and Min Ho did flawlessly. SM Entertainment does have a full in-house team of producers and writers, but is now sort of famous for these remakes of Western songs. But just so we're clear, this is a completely legal process. It's not copying not stealing. Songwriters literally have to sign off and approve these changes. I just really want to stress that because sometimes people hear about this process or they learn that such and such song is a cover or remake and they think it's a big scandal or tea or gossip. And I hate to break this to you, but it's not that deep. Anyway, the five men continued their success streak, dropping Ring Ding Dong in 2009. The song has evolved into a bit of a meme among the K-pop community and was initially criticized for its heavily repeated lyrics. The song is so catchy that it has been voted as the number one banned song to listen to by students in Korea studying for their college entrance exams. Memes aside, the song has also become a K-pop staple song. It charted at number one on several Korean music charts, became the most viewed video on YouTube in South Korea in October 2009. It charted on the Billboard World Digital Song Sales chart for nine weeks. Its lyrics have been featured in an exhibition at the National Hangul Museum. And most importantly, it began an important musical shift for Shiny and for K-pop. 2010 saw songwriting queen BB Rexa at 17 years old writing down an idea one night that eventually became one of K-pop's biggest hits, Lucifer. <laughs> Shiny's song and album Lucifer was a massive success topping multiple Korean music charts and became the sixth best-selling album in South Korea in 2010 and demonstrated Shiny's newer, mature, and dark concept. Serving to highlight its members' impressive vocals and exceptional dancing, choreographed by renowned Japanese choreographer Rino Nakasone, Shiny won Best Dance Performance at the Mnet Asian Music Awards. The album also marked the first time the Shiny members had significant input into the overall all creative direction of their artistry. Jong Hyun once challenged the public's misconception of K-pop idols being manufactured by making sure people knew SM gave the keys to drive starting with this record. A smart move on their part because Shiny was not afraid to try new things, experiment, 
and challenge the industry. Shiny debuted in Japan with the Japanese version of Replay, which was certified gold by the RIAJ, selling more than 91,000 copies in its first week, the highest sales record on Oricon for any Korean group at this time. Shiny made history becoming the first Asian artist to perform at Abbey Road Studios in London and the first K-pop group to play a solo concert in London when they did so at the London Korean Film Festival 2011. That same year, Shiny began its long history of giving back by joining joining the Korean Red Cross and UNICEF for their Help African Children project. And rounding out 2011, Shiny's first Japanese studio album was released and sold over 100,000 copies, also being certified gold by the RIAJ. Spearheading the charge in the heat of K-pop's second generation, Shiny's fourth mini album, Sherlock, became the fifth best-selling album of the year in 2012. Its title track, a mashup of two new songs on the album, demonstrated how daring Shiny was proving to be, combining New Jack Swing, hip hop, dance pop, and brassy explosions as K-pop's first hybrid remix track. Sherlock is frequently included in many best K-pop songs lists from places like Billboard, Melon, Rolling Stone, and more. It reached number four on Billboard's World Digital Song Sales chart and was nominated for Song of the Year at the Mamas in 2012. Shiny's first Japan tour set a record for most people in attendance to a Korean act's first Japan tour with over 200,000 people. Their hit, Dazzling Girl, was chosen to be the theme song for Japanese TV show, Tsukiri. Its follow-up ballad, Senen Zutto Soba Ni Ite, became a top three hit in Japan as well. The following few years would prove that Shiny had staying power. Shiny's third Korean album split into two parts, Dream Girl and Why So Serious respectively, saw the members experimenting with musical genres as K-pop became more known outside of Asia, in large part due to Psy's viral hit Gangnam Style. Shiny won Artist of the Year at the Melon Music Awards. Forbes included Shiny on their Korea Power Celebrity list in 2014. They were the only Korean artist invited to China's popular Lunar New Year program, View, a song co-written and produced by member Jong Hyun, became the most watched K-pop music video in the world in May 2015 and once again saw Shiny experiment with new genres. Its accompanying album, Odd, reached number one on Billboard's World Albums chart. Their fourth full-length Japanese album went number one on Oricon. They held numerous successful tours, fan meetings, and concerts across Asia, and by 2017, Shiny ranked 8th in Japan for concert attendance numbers with roughly 539,000 attendees. Shiny is not just successful as a group, though. Individually, the members are just as incredible. Did you know, Onu got discovered kind of thanks to a girl's generation. Originally skeptical of his own music skills despite great support from his parents, Onu finished high school and found himself at SM Academy. During Girls' Generation's debut showcase, Isuman spotted him and asked Onyu to audition on the spot, and the next day, Onyu was officially signed to SM Entertainment, where he trained for over a year. Looks like Onyu went into the new world with Girls' Generation too. The leader of Shiny, Lee Jin Ki, is known for his warm and beautiful vocals and dynamic range. Onyu has co-written multiple songs for Shiny and has starred in various musicals and TV shows. He's contributed to multiple OST songs, and his debut mini album Voice hit number two on the Circle album chart. During his time in the military, Onyu participated in various military musicals, and following his discharge, Onyu continued releasing music in Korean and Japanese and touring across Japan. His first Korean solo album also reached number three on the circle chart in 2023. Choi Mino is also an accomplished singer, songwriter, and actor. Growing up in Incheon, South Korea, Mino was discovered via SM's casting system in 2006 and was a model for Ha Sung Peck's Soul collection before debuting with Shiny in 2008. He's appeared in other music videos, most notably fellow colorful skinny jean iconic bop Girls' Generation's G. He starred in To The Beautiful You alongside label mate Sully of FX. Starring in multiple variety shows as an MC, Mino continued his acting career in projects like Derailed, which premiered at the 2016 Cannes Film Festival. He also appeared in Yumi Cells in 2021, and his solo EP Chase reached number four on the circle chart at the end of 2022. Mino was the first Korean artist to be included in Vogue's list of sexiest men alive, which makes sense because have you seen him? Mino has also written 41 songs in Shiny's discography to date, including title track hits Love Like Oxygen, Juliet, 
Hello and Dream Girl. Kim Kiboom, aka Ki, is a multi threat in the industry responsible for iconic memes, knowing literally everyone's choreography, even if he's seen it for the very first time. His variety show memories and unbelievable talent. Primarily raised by his grandmother, Key competed in many water skiing competitions in middle school before successfully auditioning at SM's National Audition Tour. After debuting with Shiny, Key appeared alongside his label mates in various activities like Sha Junsu of TVXQ, Girls' Generation, Itook of Super Junior, EXO, and BOA. Appearing in the Korean production of Broadway musical Catch Me If You Can, he has had several acting credits, including the NBC drama The Guardians, for which he won Best New Actor in 2017. As a solo artist, Ki has collaborated with Years and Years, Taeon, Soyu of Sistar, Soyeon of G-Idol, and many others. His debut album, Face, was listed as one of the best albums of 2018 by many Korean publications, and his follow-up album, Gasoline, was also selected as one of the best albums of 2022 by Idology. He is a fashion designer and is a fashion director at SM Entertainment, creating numerous iconic tour looks for Shiny and the style concept for View, as well as his solo albums, of course. He's been a successful host on variety shows like Amazing Saturday, and his viral recipe for black tonic tea soju contributed to an 83% annual sales increase for the company. He also once became a special editor for El Korea, sharing his own lifestyle column. Heimin is the fourth multi-threat and shiny and youngest member, debuting with the group at 14 years old. Most known for his impeccable dance skills, Heimin has quite the resume aside from shiny. He participated in SM's first unofficial supergroup unique unit for Max Step, the single highlighted SM's best dancers at the time in collaboration with Hyundai. He would go on to join official supergroup Super M in 2019, whose debut album debuted at number one on the Billboard 200 in the USA, selling over 168,000 copies. His debut mini album Ace went number one in South Korea, and his Japanese debut mini album Sayonara Hitori broke the top three in Japan. His second studio album Move and its title track sparked a viral trend in Korea following his performance at Seoul Fashion Week. Famous, Taemin's third mini album in Japan topped the Oricon charts upon its release and his Beyond Live online concert drew in 90,000 people across 119 different countries. He also participated in the official theme song for the 2020 Summer Olympics. Taemin has been cited numerous times by other K-pop idols as their inspiration for chasing their dreams, such as TXT's Taehyun, Astro's Rocky, ATEEZ's Songhwa, and has even earned the respect of his seniors like Rain and Boa. Kim Jonghyun was one of K-pop's most impressive vocalists, songwriters, and producers. Initially dropping out of high school to pursue music, Jonghyun was scouted by SM Entertainment at 15 years old while playing at a festival with his band at the time. Following his debut with Shiny, he appeared on several variety shows and collaborated with other artists. He composed a gloomy clock for IU and joined SM's earliest supergroup of sorts, SM The Ballad, for their second EP. Jonghyun Jonghyun also co-wrote Pretty Boy for Taemin's debut mini-album. In January 2015, Jonghyun dropped his debut solo mini-album, Bass. Its accompanying title track, Crazy Guilty Pleasure, became the most viewed K-pop music video for the month and went number one on the Circle and Billboard charts. Its other single, Deja Vu, did well on music charts and got several music show wins. Jonghyun's first full studio album, She Is, received critical acclaim from music critics, even being nominated for an album Ponsong at the 31st Golden Disc Award. In addition to music, Jonghyun published a book titled Skeleton Flower, Things That Have Been Released and Set Free, discussing his songwriting experiences. He also hosted a popular radio show too. Jonghyun was voted as one of the top five vocalists in all of K-pop in 2015. His daring productions and lyrics broke ground as he is often credited as the first artist in K-pop to significantly participate in writing, producing, 
arranging, composing, and conceptualizing an album at SM Entertainment. Jung Hyun's level of involvement in his projects was rare and unmatched for the company. He was unfailingly kind and outspoken about many things, which is why it came as a massive shock in 2017 when he passed away from suicide in December. His heavy loss sent shock waves across the globe and shook the K-pop industry to its core. A public funeral was held in the Asan Medical Center on December 9th and was attended by friends and fans alike such as Girls' Generation, BOA, IU, BTS, EXO, and his group mates. A private service was held for family and close friends, and he was laid to rest in an unknown location. In 2019, a study by Swedish digital platform Record Union conducted a survey that showed 73% of independent artists struggle with mental illness. That number rose to 80% when honing in on the age group 18 to 25. Stress, anxiety, and depression are among the most common struggles. As an independent artist myself for 16 years, I can tell you that I'm no stranger to those struggles as well. In the time since losing Jonghyun, we have also lost Gohara from Kara, Sully of FX, and more recently, Moonbin of Astro. This is just within K-pop, but the music industry is a big place. And there are many people that should be here today that aren't even if you and I don't know their names. This is because there's a stigma around mental illness and also the tools to learn how to handle mental illness are sometimes very difficult to find. The music industry is not only an industry that places an emphasis on perfectionism, but it's also one of the industries of the world where criticism is so normalized. So much so to the point where people in the comment sections will write nonstop streams of anonymous hate comments over and over and over again, honing in on one word or one aspect of a person, oftentimes thinking that the celebrity will never see them, or they do it with the intent so that the celebrity doesn't ever get a break from them. People pick apart your weight, your voice, your talents, your mishaps, your outfits, the choices you make, the choices you don't make, the causes you support, where you shop, what you say or what you don't say, how you react, how you don't react. All the minute details that sound absolutely ridiculous when you list them out, but absolutely happen everywhere around the globe, every minute, even as we're talking right now. Being a famous artist has a lot of benefits, but it also comes at a cost. Being held to an impossible standard, some people more than others, plays tricks on your mind when you're home alone in the one moment that you can actually think about it. Then the next day, you get up and you play a sold out arena. But if you talk about being unhappy when you are in a place of extreme privilege, then many people will call you out on it, labeling you as ungrateful for what you have, when you might just be innocently trying to talk about your struggles, which reinforces the notion that you should just stay silent. However, you should not be silent. Silence is this industry's biggest disease. But fortunately, conversations and understanding of mental health issues are evolving and improving every day too. And while the cause is sometimes heartbreaking to discuss, the long list of positive effects from Jong Hyun's death matter too and are everlasting. Jong Hyun's second studio album, released posthumously as Poet Artist, made Jong Hyun only the fourth Korean soloist to ever appear on the Billboard 200 chart. All of the profits from album sales were given to Jong Hyun's mother, and in his honor, she created the Shiny Foundation. The Shiny Foundation is an organization aimed at helping young musicians struggling with their mental health. Lee Eun Kyung, his mother, told Esquire Korea that the foundation's main goal is to establish a psychological consultation center that will give young artists a place to heal their souls of the various scars they receive from being public figures. Jong Kyung's composition royalties go to funding the foundation as they host a charity art gala every December. In other words, if you're streaming Jong Kyung's music or Shiny songs that Jong Jonghyun has written, you're doing a really good thing. And as I said earlier, I've provided a direct link in the description if you would like to join me in supporting the Shiny Foundation more directly. Shiny will always be five because it's as five, even now, that they've left their mark on the world. The members are funny, quick-witted, and exceptionally skilled, who've broken a lot of ground collectively and as a unit. 
Nowadays, K-pop fans want artists who are very much involved in their music like Stray Kids, G-Idol, Seventeen, and more. Part of the reason that became a thing is because SHINee proved it was possible. The artistic choice is more meaningful, more impressive, and all around freeing rather than the one that is chosen for you. Inspired by the times to upload a dance routine on a horrible quality video, in comfortable clothes practicing, that one video has evolved into dance practice videos of today. Every time you watch your favorite artist post a polished video of their comeback rehearsal, however chill or with multiple camera effects, you're seeing the lasting effects from a silly decision made in 2008. Sure, Shiny is not credited, but the fact that it's not only there for you to watch, but now expected from K-pop fans today shows the echo of a YouTube era gone by. Another way Shiny has carved their name into history books is how Shiny is one of K-pop's earliest and most outspoken supporters of the LGBTQ community. He has not only collaborated with queer artists like Ollie Alexander, but has spoken about how fashion should not be limited to gender, something Taemin echoed in his move choreography in which he purposefully intended to blend masculine and feminine move sets because dance is art. Mino played a gay character on his show Yumi Sells and posted pictures on Instagram about his travels to London during Pride Month. Jonghyun, most famously in December 2013, changed his Twitter profile picture to an image of a message written by a trans bisexual student that criticized South Korea's discrimination against the LGBTQ community when Jonghyun had about 922,000 followers. Jonghyun reached out to the person directly during what's known as the Anyang protests, telling them that as a celebrity and minority of sorts facing scrutiny, Jonghyun understood what the student was going through, even if it truly didn't compare to what the Anyang students were protesting being LGBTQ+. This move drew praise and negative reaction, but Jonghyun affirmed his support. And if you want to know why SM Entertainment Halloween parties are so iconic, well, you can thank Shiny for that too when they showed up as the only five people dressed up in 2013, and Isuman decided all artists should dress up from then on. The Modern Language Association reported that the number of U.S. college students taking a Korean language class rose by almost 45% between 2009 and 2013, long before BTS and Blackpink made undeniable headway around the globe. Between 2013 to 2016, it grew by 13.7%. Chinese impact on the Hallyu wave isn't just in the comments sections of millennials being nostalgic about the past, it's in nearly every facet of what K-pop looks like today, whether they're actively acknowledged for it or not. During their comeback album, Don't Call Me in 2021, in an interview with Rolling Stone, Mino said the biggest change that has happened in Shiny's career is with social media and the amount of communication between fan and artist now. When Shiny debuted with Replay, YouTube was a small community to hang out on akin to TikTok in 2020. Silly dances, funny parodies, and promotional works dotted the platform in a time where music videos were not just another video on there. Shiny deserves their flowers for the amount of things that they've been through and for going from rookie Grand Slam to legendary experts, continuing to inspire the top talent of today. Combining skills in production, songwriting, fashion, acting, writing, and singing to create a dynamic group unrivaled in performance, Shiny rose to the success of boy groups before them and in the process carved their own destiny. For helping to define the identity of a generation and inspire the innovations in another, for turning tragedy into majesty and forging a healthier path for for artists to follow in the music industry, Shiny deserves every ounce of credit. There's still a long way to go, but the fact that we're even where we are now is directly because of them. That's why Shiny matters even in today's K-pop world. That's why they mean something to so many people. And if you still don't believe me, well then. Baby.